In this chapter, I'll give you a short introduction to experimentation with Setry. What this means is that we'll start out by talking about how to structure an experimental session. Now, this is something that's not specific to Setry, but it you need to know for any set, uh, experiment and particularly any computerized experiment. After that, we'll talk about really the characteristics of Setry, the features that Setry offers for your experiment. We'll then discuss shortly uh, networking. Um, Setry does a lot of the networking for you. The only thing is you need to tell Setry one or two things uh, so that it can uh, connect the server and the clients. We'll discuss how you can do that. We'll also talk about the command line options that you can provide both to the server program and to the client programs. And finally, we'll talk about the file types used by Setri or created by Setri, such that after your experiment, when you find all of these output files on your hard drive, you know what is in them and how you can use them. Let's start by discussing how a typical experimental session looks like. Well, what we do before that, and I'll not cover this now, is of course invite subjects and maybe build up a subject pool and so on. But we assume we start at the point where the subjects arrive at your experimental lab. Then what do you do? Well, you check them off your list so you know who is there. Um, you send home subjects who turn up but who you don't need because um, usually or often we need a specific number of subjects to participate in our experiment, but since not all invited subjects always turn up for an experimental session, we invite more than we need and then send home those uh, surplus subjects if you want, and they get a show up fee, so a small payment uh, for their trouble of showing up, and also so they show up next time again. So we send home those subjects we do not need for the current experiment, and then randomly assign the subjects that are there and that will participate to their workstations. So I, what I use for that is I, I've printed out cards with numbers on them and the numbers on the cards correspond to the numbers on the seats, on the, on the places, um, workplaces in the lab. And so I tell them pick a card uh, and then go into the lab and sit down at the workstation corresponding to this number. So once everybody's seated and has, um, well, properly arrived, I either hand out the printed instructions or in most cases I actually already have them lying at the desks for the subjects and uh, tell them that we're going to read them together. So why do we read them together? I, I'm, I will read them, I do read them out loud so everybody can follow along for two reasons. The first reason is that some people um, have an easier time uh, grasping written information and some have an easier time grasping heard oral information. So that's why they have printed instructions. They can read them, but I also read them out so that they can hear them. And secondly, and this is very important in some experiments, um, I often want to make sure that everybody knows that everybody has the same instructions. And the one way I can do that is by reading out the instructions with everybody following along. And so they know that everybody heard the same thing and that other people in the lab do not get instructions that uh, differ from their own instructions. Then once we've covered the instructions, uh, I like to have or to ask control questions. These control questions are solely intended to make sure that the subjects have understood the most important parts of the instructions. They should be as short as possible, um, but should cover all the important details so that you later on in the paper can tell your reviewers that you made sure that everybody understood uh, the instructions by making sure that everybody had to answer the control questions before they could uh, start with the experiment. Then in more complex experiments, I also usually have a training round or, or multiple training rounds where people can play an experiment with the main interface. So for example, in a market experiment with the trading interface, so they can get accustomed to this interface and they can learn what works and what doesn't work, what for example, um, generates an error message so that in the real experiment, they can focus on their decisions and not so much on how to implement them on the screen. And of course, if this takes a while, so these first three points, then this is a good um, time to have them or allow people a bathroom break before um, you head for the, the main part of the experiment. 
Now, after they return from the bathroom break, I give them instructions on the parameters. What is different here now to the instructions before? Well, in the first set of instructions, now, well, let me take a step back. Um, I don't do this in old experiments, but in more complex experiments, in the first set of, uh, of instructions, um, I teach them about the trading interface, the information they can see, or where they can see certain information, taking again this market experiment as example, where they can buy, where they can sell, where they can enter the price that they want to trade at, and so on. Um, and that's also what they train in the training periods. But I do not tell them yet what the prices are that they should trade at, how much they get paid for different actions, so that the actual parameters uh, of, for example, this market, I do not tell them because this way um, the training rounds do not generate so much of an anchor. If you tell them everything and then have them play the training rounds, then invariably they will um, use the knowledge that they have from the instructions also in the training rounds, even if you tell them, look, the training rounds don't count, play around, try and, and um, check to, better to, to, see, to see some errors and so on, so you feel confident in trading. Nevertheless, they will trade as if this was the real experiment, if you tell them all of this information. And once you start the real experiment, you will see that typical pattern is that the prices that the experiment starts at for real is exactly the price that it stopped at in the training rounds. And so you have a, this, this carryover spillover effect from the training onto the real experiment that you usually don't want. Uh, and the, the most elegant way I find to get rid of that is by separating the instructions on the interface from the instructions on the actual parameters. So what I do is I hand out another set of instructions, again, read them aloud with, my, with, with the subjects, possibly again have control questions if it's necessary, and then I start the treatment, I start the experiment proper. Now, these steps five and six can be repeated if you have multiple parts to your experiment. So new instructions, new experimental parts, new instructions again, next, next task and so on. Um, once you're done with that, um, it's customary to have a questionnaire where you ask your subjects for um, social demographics, for example. So what is gender, age, uh, maybe what they study, maybe experience they have with the topic at hand. So for example, in a market experiment, uh, I often ask them whether they have traded um, stock before, this kind of questions. And for questionnaires, I find it's the open questions usually don't help much in the analysis later on. Um, closed questions, simply Likert scale questions and so on, um, they can easily be used in the analysis. Also, this is the question areas where you elicit risk aversion, um, social preferences, social preferences, risk preferences, time preferences, and so on. After the questionnaire comes the payment. So payment is done um, individually and anonymously. And in many cases, we do not pay for the entire experimental outcome. So if we, have, we often in the experiment have multiple rounds and we often pick one round uh, to pay them for, uh, for the reasons, well, I'll not go into detail, but it changes behavior when you have multiple rounds that you're paid over comp as compared to a single round uh, and a single paying for a single round is often preferable. So we randomly pick one uh, round to pay. We, I like to do it as transparently as possible, for example, using a real die, because people don't believe uh, random number generators by computers, or of the, yeah, of the computer are really random. Yeah? So you will find people saying, well, but I don't know, maybe this was, uh, there was some trickery involved, or maybe it wasn't really random. And to get rid of this concern, I use real dice, for example. And then I pay them individually and anonymously. What this means is that I ask people to leave the lab and come in one by one to get paid. They all get um, receipts 
on their desks that are pre-filled with most information except for their names and uh, the payment amount that they have to fill in and sign and hand in to me so then I can get the, the payments refunded later on. And I also, when, when giving them their, their payments, ask them not to talk about the experiment with others so that they do not pollute in a sense the subject pool or tell uh, future subjects what to expect because that of course may influence these future subjects behavior and thus influence my results in a way that I do not want and that I would like to control for. The following steps help make every experiment success. First off, I'd like to prepare a session structure cheat sheet, um, which is basically a checklist that contains all the steps I need to take uh, before and during the experiment. So it uh, contains the required materials. So what do I need to bring to the lab? Pens, paper, dice, card, uh, dice cards, etc. cetera, um, receipts and so on. Uh, it contains the program settings that I need to make. So how to set up the, um, the client, how, how many clients to connect, um, how many groups to set up and so on. And also the procedural steps, hand out the instructions there, then have to start this program. And then after this is finished, throw the die and tell people this and this. So all of the important information that I need or all of the imp important steps that I need to take to make the experiment a success I have in this checklist because when you run an experiment, you want it to be a success and you're usually a little bit nervous and it's very easy to miss one step and that can of course compromise your experiment. So following uh, this checklist helps a lot um, to minimize this risk. Secondly, I like to keep um, a, an experimental diary uh, where I basically note down everything out of the ordinary that happens and also some of the timing. So I write down when did this start, when did this end, how long did people take, so that especially for the first few experiments, I can then um, have an overview, have a, have, a, have a rough idea about the variation in the time people take for the experiment or for specific phases of the experiment, and then can plan for uh, the future, plan the payments uh, for uh, how long it took subjects to complete the experiment and so on. And also, as, is, as it says here, no special occurrences. So if somebody left for the toilet in the middle of the experiment, I note that down simply because uh, when I later look at the data and I see, well, this subject for five minutes didn't do anything, I may wonder what happened there. And if I have my notes, if I have ex my experimental diary, I can go back and check and see, oh, everything was fine. Actually, this person just went to the bathroom or there was a crash of the set leaf or there was a question and we stopped or whatever. Yeah. And finally, back up everything, not once, but two or three times. Uh, your data is, of course, uh, your very valuable outcome from the experiment. It's costly. Um, it's costly in terms of money, in terms of time and in terms of that you use up your subject pool over time and may not be may not have enough subjects for more experiments. So you need to make sure that your data is safe. So leave it on the server, um, mail it to you, put it on a USB drive, um, do all of this and make sure that you never lose your data. So now that we have the, the general basics of running an experiment down, let's talk about Setri. Setri is an abbreviation for the Zurich Toolbox for ready-made economic experiments. And what this is, is that um, it's a relatively simple, but still very powerful programming language for economic experiments. So you can program basically every experiment in Setri, uh, and it's not too hard once you know the language, as you can guess from the, the length of this course, which is not very long, given that you learn an entire programming language. Um, but yes, it, it's still very powerful, much more powerful than for example, online um, toolboxes, there are some online toolboxes where you can make some settings and then run your experiment immediately, um, but which are limited to the specific types of experiments that are pre-programmed uh, on these websites. Setri has a client server architecture, which means that you have one server where you run your, well, where the experimenter runs the experiment from. Now this does not need to be a, a server hardware, so an actual server, well, PC, 
but can be any any normal workstation but you need to run the, the server software from there and then you have clients you have individual um, subject pcs that connect to the server um, and uh, communicate with the server and communicate with each other only via the server so there is no direct connection between the clients uh, themselves but only um, via the server now what Secret does for you automatically in the background if you want is it does the networking for you so of course you need a computer network but it connects the clients and the server for you um, it collects and saves the data and with some help from you it does the payoff calculation and what may be very important that sometimes uh, unfortunately turns out to be important is that it has some quite good crash recovery recovery capability Setri doesn't crash often or well yeah, it's very stable actually but if there is a crash for some reason maybe if you're because your computer crashes or because of course also Setri uh, has crashed um, there are some cases that you can rather easily uh, recover from there are of course some uh, scenarios where you which you cannot uh, recover from but Setri is quite good in this respect the network networking structure I'm, I'm trying to illustrate with this picture here is that you have the server um, PC the server program on a, a server at an experimental PC and you have the client PCs that connect to the server and um, exchange information with the server uh, you can also have a separate file server if you want but you can also have this uh, the files that Cetri generates and uses directly on the experimental PC now this slide looks a bit technical and it is but it contains some important information that will that will require later on so what how does the networking of the server and the clients work in Cetri well the one thing uh, you need to somehow make happen is that the clients can find the server to connect to and the way you can do this is you can on the client PC when you run the set leaf which is the the actual executable file that you well that start set tree on the clients if you want um, you can specify so-called command line parameters so open this um, program in a specific way by uh, th that includes telling the program where to find the server what you have in the back here is the so-called IP address so the unique address of the server PC and you tell set tree or in this case set leaf where to find the server in this way that's one option the second option if this is if you do not do this then Setri checks the second option the section option is second option is does um, set leaf so this set tree program as I said um, does set leaf find a file called server.eec in the same directory as the set leaf.exe file if it does it will look inside this file for this IP address so this IP address should then be in the server.eec file <coughs> If it does not find it in the same directory, it will also look in the directory C, X, e -com, um, conf, okay? And if it's also not successful there, it will take as the server IP the local machine's IP, which means um, the client will assume that the server is on the same machine as the client. That, that appears a bit nonsensical, but it makes a lot of sense when you uh, when you program and test your programs because you usually use one PC to program and test um, both and, and that PC then has both the server program running and the client program running and if you just start the set leaf file by double click it will automatically connect to the server instance running on the same PC okay uh, the, if you um, if you have multiple clients connecting to the server then the server needs to know which client can be switch and the way this happens is that you can either tell the set leaf the name it should take so you give it a name and say your pc1 and the other client is pc2 clients are pc2 and pc3 and pc4 and then the server knows uh, how to distinguish the, the clients 
or you specify you put a name.dec file in the setleaf exa directory and it will look for the name there or if all of that fails again then it will take the local machine's host name so those of you who are not familiar with this well forget it but those who are familiar know what this means um, it will take the local machine local computers um, TCP IP host name, host name as the name for the client and that generates problems in testing because if you start five leaves and you don't specifically give them a name then they will all have the same name and that will uh, lead to problems so we need to somehow tell set leaf um, give set leaf a name if we run a number of set leaves on the same client if they all run on different clients we're fine because they will just take the client machine's host name and that will be unique in the network so no problem there what other important command line options are there well on the set leaf which again is the client program you can for example set the language the default language for set leaf is german because Setri was and is being programmed in Zurich. Um, so the standard is German, but you can set it to English or a ton of other languages. You can look in the manual, there is many, many languages available. You can also set the screen size or the window size for your set leaf, which you will usually not want to do on a, on a lab PC, but which you will want to do uh, if you test uh, set your programs on your own PC and then it helps to make the set leaves a bit smaller or maybe sometimes make them exactly the size of the screen in the lab so you can see what your uh, screen would look like um, at the well given the, the size of the screen in the lab that you plan to run your experiment in. Now for the set tree remember this is a server uh, program you can tell it for example where to put all of its output files so all the data it generates where should it be saved uh, and I'll come back to what XLS, SBJ, ADR and so mean we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Setry by default runs locally in an experimental lab it does not run via the internet I mean you can run it via the internet um, it simply runs over the TCP IP protocol but that would mean that your subjects your participants would have to download the set leaf client and point it at your server and, and manage um, any firewall issues and so on and that is unrealistic so re realistically you can only run set leaf set tree in a lab except that um, recently a group in Cologne at the University of Cologne um, came up with a solution to run Setry over the web it's basically all open source and what they do just to give you an idea it's, it's called Setry Unleashed as you can see from the title of the slide what they do is they basically set up um, the client and the server in a virtual machine installation on a server PC so in a, in a virtual um, Linux system you can actually do it on a normal Linux system as well but it's more convenient in a virtual system so you have your server uh, your PC you start this virtual machine and the clients connect to this machine via remote desktop protocol now again if this does not ring a bell if you don't understand what I'm saying here don't worry about it um, this is more for the lab managers amongst you or for those who want to talk to the lab managers about this um, this needs to be set up by a professional but it's not too hard and it allows you to basically run the full set tree over the internet people just need they can actually connect um, using a browser if, if they want um, and the only things that do not work are audio and video everything else basically looks the same as on the computer in the lab and they can perform all the steps as if they were sitting at a normal uh, set leaf client finally a list of the file types that are used by set tree Let's start with the first two. We already we've already encountered them. Set tree is the server program. Set leaf is the executable for the client, so the client program. And then the set tt files are the set tree treatments. These are the files that you program. That's your program code. 
SETIQ is the same except it's for the questionnaires. It's not for the experiment, but for the questionnaires. They are saved as SETIQ files. Then you can use um, normally TXT files to input parameters into uh, set tree. And we'll cover all of this, of course, in detail in the course. Um, and then I want to uh, skip over the next few uh, to those down here. This is the output that set tree generates. It will generate at the end an ADR file that contains um, address data of the subject. Uh, it will generate a GSF file, which is a binary file that can get quite large. It contains basically all of the, well, every decision, every step, every action that was taken in the experiment. There are tools available that allow you to read that. Um, there is the payment file that contains the payout information that you need to pay your subjects. There is the SPJ file, which contains basically the questionnaire responses. And the XLS file, which is not really an Excel file, but can be open in Excel, that contains all the data output from your experiment. Now, finally, let's return to these middle files. These ones down here, these are temporary files that you don't really need to worry about. Uh, these ones are actually quite convenient. Whenever you run your experiment or your questionnaire, Setri will automatically create a, a backup copy of the program you're running on your hard drive. And that is useful in case that you make a mistake and actually in your programming actually cause Setri to crash because you will always have a copy of the latest version that you worked on. So during programming, sometimes you can um, well, you can program, generate program mistakes that may actually cause a crash of set tree, and then you might lose your data, but you will not in this case because set tree, before running the program, it will make a backup copy and then only run it. So you will always have this backup copy um, available to make sure you don't lose your progress uh, on your code.